Hey, what's up family? So today's video is going to be about the general concept of creating NeuroBase. Now, before we get into going any further, I think that it's important to talk about what NeuroBase is, or at least what the theory behind it is, because it's very similar to a lot of other different bases that we hear in electronic music. And on top of that, it's kind of difficult to distinguish of like, well, what's the difference between a dubstep bass and a growl bass? And the truth is, it's or there's a very thin line that differentiates the two. So generally speaking, NeuroBase was kind of founded based off of resampling what we call the re-space, which is just something that is detuned. So if I pull up an instance of Serum and I just detune a saw wave that's a little too high, then basically it would be processing off of that. And then further down the line, we started using resampling processing effects on FM synthesis and then other source sounds to basically create this kind of utopia of bass creation. Uh, typically, you're going to hear neuro bass within neuro style of music, neuro styles of music, which include drum and bass, uh, neuro funk, neuro hop, that also kind of bleed over into just about every other genre. But it's really special because, for one, it's a lot of fun to make. Once you figure out how to make these basses, then it becomes incredibly efficient. I think that it usually takes me around 10 to 15 minutes to create something usable. And then once you understand how to shape tones, then creating different variations is actually pretty easy. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look into some of the components for designing NeuroBase. Now, as I said before, this video is going to not necessarily tell you how to do a specific base. I'd rather cover the process chain or the formula of how you can go about making your own NeuroBases because really it's just having a source sound and then knowing which effects to apply and then knowing how to apply those effects in a particular way to get a sound that you desire. So if you're brand new to sound design, then it's totally fine for you to just follow along the video for the bass that I'm going to make. However, if you have a little bit more experience in sound design and you understand your tools a little bit better, then you'll start to see where things can fit in and you can basically explore. You know, it's one thing to explore without knowing where to go, but it's also another thing to know how to explore. You know, it's like if you're a Boy Scout, you learn how to survive in the wilderness. But if you're a child who's seven years old and knows nothing, then your chances of surviving are very little. That's right. This is about life and death. It's music. So anywho, let's go ahead and pull up one of my most trusted images that actually isn't from me, but is very, very useful. Okay, so this is the NeuroBase theory, quote unquote, from the Glitch Kitchen, and I think that they did a phenomenal job of looking at kind of the components that go into this, and I think that this is a great reference, so to speak, and it also has visualization. There's a couple things that I might change within it, but that's my own personal taste, but let's go ahead and cover this list or this formula in order to, you know, basically create and shape some really cool tones. By the way, I haven't created a bass yet today. We're going to go ahead and make one through this video, so it's probably going to end up being longer than usual because I'm going to want to tweak it and then make it sound nice and whatever. But I think that this is a really cool uh, component that kind of will demystify of how to make those sounds like Cohen sound or like Noisia. Granted, mine aren't as good, but I imagine that the formula, quote unquote, is still pretty similar. So first up, we have a waveform. And a waveform is basically a source sound. It can be anything. You can use a sample, you can use a basic wave shape, but the underlining tone within that, as we look here, is that it's clean, it's full, and harmonically rich. So there's a couple of ways that we can get that through either detuning of, or sorry, stacking um, unison. We can do that through FM. We can do that by using a sine wave and introducing distortion to create kind of a sine tone. It's not really important of how we get there. I mean, it is when you get to specifics, but as long as you have a source that's clean and harmonically rich, then you can basically use that to start cutting frequencies because that is where everything kind of comes alive anyways, which goes into the next thing, which is movement, kind of like what I already covered. You can do detuning through spreading it out. You can do detune through unison. You can do movement through uh, FM where you're introducing more or less uh, harmonics or you can use it as a wavetable and that is ultimately why serum is generally looked at as one of the most common tools for this type of practice 
because all of those features are basically right here within the oscillator itself. So if I pull up a wave shape, let's go to analog and like basic shapes or something so that way it's not too... You can see that here's a knob here that changes the wavetable. The detuning function is right here. And then I can also click on this and go to FM from here and introduce all of those different kinds of movements right out of the box. And that's pretty significant. I'll cover later of where we can basically shake things up a bit as opposed to, well, okay, I get that I can use FM, but how do I use FM? So I'll cover that here in a later, uh, later down the line, but let's just continue going from there. All right, so next up we have our filter movement. Now, with the filter movement, it doesn't necessarily have to be movement from a filter. This can be through effects as well. I think that the most important thing that we're looking at right here is that if you notice on from filter movement to resampling is that it's highlighted in green. And that means that this particular component can be uh, switched back and forth from any, like these, these components here are interchangeable, so to speak. Now, the only thing that I'm not really going to cover today that, well, I'm not going to go into detail is frequency separation. And it's not that that isn't a fantastic tool to use. It's not that you can't get some really interesting tones that way. But for me, I've found that throwing the sub in mono and then processing the whole thing has gotten me better results for the types of sounds that I make. And I think that frequency splitting gives you a cleaner sound, but... Again, it all depends on how you're thinking about using your bass in the context, okay? So yeah, we have filter movement, which there's any, any type of filter will do. It just depends on the tones that you're looking for. Nine times out of 10, you're going to see a band reject, which is a notch, and then probably a band pass because those are the most general, like deep generating tones. And the way that you use a band pass is kind of specific as well. Again, we'll cover that here in a second. So next up we have distortion. And distortion can be applied actually through any of these. So you can do the source distortion, you can do the detuning and then distortion or vice versa. Like the distortion in itself is generally very interchangeable and you're probably gonna end up using multiple distortions through a chain. So finally we have effects in space and this is going to be the most finicky one because this is going to really define how washy or how clean your sound becomes because you can still have a really thick sound, like you can have a wall of sound and cut it up nicely with filtering, but where it sits in the mix, if it's not in mono, is going to be determined by your reverb, comb, filter, chorus. So like this is going to be the most delicate part of your processing in my opinion. So I actually wanna add something after this where I would always throw in like a limiting at the end of the channel or something, or uh, compression is right here, but I think that like uh, multiband distortion is probably, or multiband compression is, is something that is pretty essential at the end of your chains because it's going to help balance that sound out. And again, like it, it's kind of like, I don't know, these are going to get into like my personal like changes about how this goes. And then finally at the end we have resampling, which you will repeat to audio, but we can also add another thing after that of resampling where you throw it in a sampler or you do the whole process over again. And we'll kind of get into that right about now. So that's kind of a general overview about how neurobase theory works. Now, because I've been doing this for a really long time, I actually haven't opened up Ableton in a couple of weeks because I've been busy with other things. But because I have a deep understanding about how the formula works, the formula itself kind of becomes ingrained within you. And this will help you design other sounds as well. And it doesn't have to be a base per se, but this is a great way to explore not only how to use your tools, but how to achieve really neat movements. Yeah, let's get started. Whew, I need some water. Okay, so let's go ahead and initialize the patch. Actually, it's probably basic enough that I could just go from there, but yeah, whatever. All right, so I'm not gonna reference that, that chart anymore because now we're going to get into my own kind of processing of like how we do things. But from here on out, I'm just going to start making creative decisions that are going to be along the guidelines of what we're talking about, but I don't know how the sound is gonna come up but it doesn't matter because we're gonna you know, basically just do some cool stuff and then figure out how to make it work. Okay, so I'm actually going to do a sine wave and I am going to modify that with a square wave. 
maybe I'll actually do a custom wavetable that has a science where maybe I'll do a custom wavetable that has <clears throat> something that goes from simple to complicated. So on the first cycle, I'm going to do that and go from here. And then I'm going to hold shift and highlight this. I'm going to morph this into a crossfade. So that way, this will begin to get more complicated. Actually, I don't want to do that. Um, I'm going to delete these. And go to remove. And then from here, I'm going to highlight this and then morph this. So now the process in between that should be, there you go. Now I like this because it still has characteristics of a sine wave, but as you can tell, it kind of evens itself out more to the saw. Uh, there is a square that's right here, but that's okay because I'm going to be using this as a means of FM. Sorry, on this one. Nope, I had it right the first time. And let's just see. I want this to be a little bit lower. Maybe I'll make this one lower instead. And then I'll probably end up doing a direct sub out because you can tell that now the place of the movement is going from ear to ear or it's being spread out so much already. So Now let's introduce some movement. It's kind of fast, so I want that to kind of slow down a little bit. see what happens if I do this now. Okay, so at this moment, um, one thing that I'd like to keep in mind is that because the square wave has such high, mar high harmonics in it already, I want to be mindful and probably take that out with filtering down the line and then kind of push it out later. So um, I don't really like that higher octave note right there. So we'll take that out here in a second. But right now I'm just trying to create some movement down in the lower end and basically make the sound a little bit thicker. And I want to be careful of spreading this out too much in the beginning because if I start adding too much distortion from the bat, it's just going to sound like it's a, a wave of, of noise and I don't really want that much. So here's some distortion. Just a little bit. Let's add some chorus. And I think what I'm going to do actually is throw this into a low pass and go into a pre here and just take off that. So that way only the low end is being uh, distorted. There we go. And maybe just a little bit more. So 
So when we go back and throw in an OTT in later, I guess we can do that now just for demonstration purposes, but it'll reintroduce some of that high end that I've taken off from here. So that's a pretty thick sound, and I, I like the way that that's coming out. Let's see what happens if we just crank this. Okay, and then let's go ahead and add just a little bit of white noise crunch. Um, there's one that I like in particular, it's paper bag. We're going to set this key tracking here. Turn the pitch up. So now we're getting a nice thick sound and from here we can go into filtering if we want. Um, I'm going to do it in a kind of an unconventional way by doing uh, notch sweeps from here as opposed to using a regular filter but it's just kind of what I'm used to. So let's go ahead and add in an LFO here, sweep that frequency and I want it to kind of just cover those low mid areas. This one here is going to have the same, just for sake of efficiency, the same thing, but they're going to interact with each other, hopefully around that low mid area. So that sounds pretty cool but the shape of everything is kind of boring to me because it just sounds kind of like an LFO. And um, I'd like it to kind of have a different, how do I say, something of a different shape. So let's just start making something interesting. Which is kind of cool about Serum because you can basically double click anywhere, like so, and create interesting shapes. So we have a creative choice that we can make right here as well. I'm not really sure if I want to leave this on to continue going every time I push a, or if I want to set this to re-trigger. I think I'm just going to leave it here just for, I can always go back and push re-trigger on this, but, but that sounds pretty sick already. but I'm going to move this EQ under the compressor because I want the compressor to pull these tones out more. Okay, so before I go any further, like if I really wanted to, I can basically start processing the bass. Well, I guess I've already done some processing, but I can like start um, mixing this for to get ready for a song right off the bat, even though we're not done creatively. But if we take a look at what's going on, we have our source sound, we have our movement that's introduced via FM, wavetable position, and filtering, which I'm using for the EQ. We have our distortion and our spatial effects through chorus and detuning. We can kind of tell from what we were looking at from before of having our source, our movement, our filter, and then distortion, and then we're kind of basically just playing with the chain, or I guess the order of effects of what we're doing within that. And even though I'm not really done with this bass, we've already created some really interesting movement and we can make changes to that. And for example, if I really wanted to, I can mix up the distortion before or after the chorus or the EQ and I can basically just kind of mix and match here. Typically speaking, I go through this very quickly 
And right now I'm kind of like walking through and experimenting, but this process is usually the fastest for me because it's really easy for me to just generate something and then throw an LFO or throw, do something on it and create a movement. But the real fun comes from the processing that we do after. Uh, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to pull up a project, not a project, but something from my templates, uh, something recent. We can pull up a Falcon Reese, and then we can kind of just get a general overview of the chain processing that I've done here. And then we'll go through and basically make something similar. So we have our source sound on this. Let's see how this sounds. Hopefully this isn't loud. And if you look, we have our EQ, distortion, filtering, saturation, filtering. I would call this distortion. And that's pretty much it. I'm guessing that, oh, the spatial is coming from the reverb at the very end of the chain. So yeah, you can actually throw in the spatial effect before to get a different tone, but this is just kind of like a yeah, I actually like that a lot. Maybe I'll cover how to do that in a future video. Um, but yeah, going back to our bass that we're making right off the bat, here's what we have so far. And we basically need to beef that up and make it sound more interesting. So let's go ahead, and you might see me reference this a few times just because this is my general practice, but yeah, let's go ahead and start with an EQ. From a lot of people that I've watched, I'm gonna go ahead and give a shout out right now to Bass Gorilla because that's where I've actually learned a crap ton of this stuff. But from a lot of the professionals that I've, I've seen do this stuff, they generally EQ after every creative choice. So you're gonna see me probably do that a lot depending on how the sound goes, but I'm listening to the sound as opposed to just copying the formula as well. So you might see me make changes here and there. All right, so first up is I'm gonna take out some of those low mids. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually boost right next to it. Probably boost the highs a little bit as well. Take out some of the super lows. Now let's go ahead and make this really loud. So I'm gonna go here and go to a basic three band. And this is my default one that I use. It's actually a default on the Pro MB thing already, but I'm gonna basically just turn this up and see how that sounds. So most of the growling tones are coming from our mid range. So we kind of want to accentuate that and keep that in mind as we continue to process this bass. That being said, we can have a little bit of fun and go into some creative distortion. This is a means of distortion, by the way. It's like just doing multi-band compression, but I'm using it to like make everything louder and add harmonics. So I guess technically, yeah, it is distortion. I like distortion. It's nice. Let's go ahead and add some trash. And I almost always defer to the tape saturation. And I'll kind of see if I can blow it up a bit. Let's go ahead and see what I can do with a convolver and see if that will give me any other kind of cool tones before I start cutting this. Oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe I can set that to a low mix. I don't know if you can tell or not, but that kind of had some some valley-ness to it. 5.1. So we can use that to our advantage and basically kind of draw that out more because again nine times out of ten when I'm making um, neuro bases I want it to be as deep as I can I don't really like the screechy uh, or squelchy 
narrow bases. I like the ones that are really deep and full and thick and like kind of like move with you, you know, that kind of like pull you around as opposed to like a wee woo wee woo. <laughs> I don't know. You guys know what I'm talking about though. And it can make it you can make it work and some some people do it really well. Like Cursa can do it, but I, I don't like it personally. So that's my two cents. So there's a lot of movement within that already, and I think that we can go ahead and introduce some more because it's the movement isn't taking away from the frequencies. It's adding, if anything. So what I would do from here is basically go into filtering. And this is, I used to hate the auto filter because it only has two poles that you can cut from, but because of the functions that you can do with it now, uh, most specifically using a Max for Live device and the morph filter, you can get some really neat tones off of it now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just add an eight bar loop of F. I always make my bases an F. That sounds kind of cool already. Here, and I'm going to try to defer from uh, leaving this on loop and making you listen to this over and over and over again. I'm just going to kind of stop, play, stop, play. So I'm going to set this to the morph function, where it's doing that, which is kind of cool. But I think that I'm going to mess with the range because I don't want it to flip so much. Yeah, that's fine. And maybe I'll just turn the rate down and move this over towards the midsection. Sorry, I, I was kind of mesmerized by that for a sec. Uh, yeah, I think that sounds really good. Maybe just a little bit of resonance. Maybe not. I, again, like resonance within filtering is one of the things that you have to be most careful with whenever you're talking about making your basses squelchy. Like that's the number one thing that's going to start giving it that that undesirable tone. And the key to it is just having just enough. Just enough. Um, I'm going to mess around and kind of backtrack a sec and throw in another notch just to see what happens in between the distortion here. And I'm just going to use LFOs because I'm lazy. And I'm going to set that to a slightly higher rate. So I like how some of those tones are coming out and because we've cut so many frequencies or because we're continuously cutting frequencies, not only with this really thick notch, but with the morph filter as well, we need to basically reintroduce some of that back. And I'm going to do that via saturation. So something you should be mindful of whenever you use Saturn is that this always turns us down to about one dB. So kind of just go over here and then set that back to zero. The dynamics function is really cool to play with because it's kind of a transient shaper. And sometimes you can get like some cool stuff, especially if you add reverb before or after. Um, let's see if this makes any difference if I do this. So I like that there's kind of a percussiveness to that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and turn this into um, and turn that first thing into a, uh, not a pluck, but kind of like a, a percussive element. So I'm going to go here and go to global, go to master tuning, and I'm going to make this an ADSR here. Give this just a little bit of attack. And we'll start from 12. Yeah, that's way too fast, so the decay is at one second, so we need to make this super short. Still really fast. Getting there. Cool. 
Now that kind of has like a, a kick to it, which is kind of cool. Um, maybe turn that down even. Still fast. And that's kind of where some of the tweaking comes in within this experimentation. Nice. Okay. Wait, let's do the Cohen sound. Dope. Sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> All right, so that sounds pretty good. Let's look at our chain for reference of what we were doing. So this actually came after the filtering. I think that's a double notch right there. Yeah, we're not doing as many notches, but there's that. So I added an OTT after that, and then some multiband, leveled it out, added some reverb. So we are almost done with this bass, although I'm actually going to do some experimentation. I'm going to see what happens when we throw a chorus on this. I like it when it just it's in your face, but for what I've been listening to lately, especially Dear God, Cohen Sound's Polychrome album, if you haven't listened to that, dude, go listen to it right now. It's awesome. Maybe we can kind of replicate some of those tones that are a little bit similar. Probably not. I'm not a Cohen sound level designer, but I can try. Let's go to the chorus and go to standard chorus two. This is going to be overdone quite a bit, but we can tune it. That actually sounds really cool. Oh. Cool, so that widened the sound out by quite a bit. But it kind of softened it up a little bit too much. So we're gonna turn this down by quite a bit. From here, I'm gonna add in an OTT. Don't know what to do, OTT it. And probably turn down the amount like significantly. And basically what this did is, like, if we listen to it without... It's not a whole lot, but what it's helping do is add some more high end. So we have our high band, our mid band, and our low band right here. And the OTT usually does a pretty good job of balancing the sound out right here. And I over almost always overdo it. I'm going to actually throw in another multiband from FabFilter to kind of balance the sound out before I uh, before I limit it, but this is a really good way to reintroduce some of that high end again. Let's play with some pitch playing, see how that sounds. So something to keep in mind is that when you're working in MIDI, if you're doing pitch bending, uh, it's going to be, you're going to have to do some work around in order to get kind of like that uh, oscillating tone if you want it to go faster or slower. And the way that we can achieve that is by going to the note and then throwing the note on the LFO speed and setting that to key tracking. So I'm not going to do that, but that is a workaround. So yeah, you go to note and then you go to the speed of it. And then the higher note that you play, the faster it's going to um, to revolve or the faster revolution it's going to be, or I don't really know what you'd say since it's like a, a continuous cycle, the faster it's going to cycle. Um, but the way that I would generally go about this is the second process after, which be, would be through resampling because it makes the entire process a lot easier. Uh, but yeah, let's continue. Okay, so now I'm gonna go in here and do this. And the only thing that I'm going to do on here is just set this to three bands. And I'm not really going to, I don't think that I'm going to mess with it. I might. Maybe I might pull up the highs just a little bit. And what I'm trying to do is basically kind of flatten out the sound. And this is particularly difficult to achieve sometimes, especially when you have filter movement, because it's not a wall of sound. So you can't just look at it and be like, oh, well, I can cut or boost here. 
it's constantly moving. But what I want to try to steer away from is something that is either too loud or try to bring up something that is too quiet if it's playing, if it's cycling through the entire movement. Right now it seems to be okay. And the reason why I want to do this is because when I go and throw the limiter on here and turn the sound up, I don't want there to be specific peaks that are going over. And if it does a little bit, it's okay. But if it's too much, then it's not, it's not really good. So let me crank this. Okay, so one of the drawbacks from the OTT is that if you add a limiter with the OTT, you get this artifact that kind of is this, it's not a buzz because it's a single tone, but it kind of sounds like a computer circuit shortage. Let, let's see if you can identify it. Yeah, I, I can hear it, but that's because I've been doing this for so long. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to throw in another notch at the on the top end right after. And I'm going to set this to be pretty quick and not have too, too low of a resonance and set that here and then see if I can just kind of eliminate that or at least quiet it a little bit. That's a little better. I can still hear it though. Let me see if I can accentuate this a little more just so that you guys can hear what I'm talking about. If you're doing a sign compression bass, you're going to run into this the most. Hold on, let me set this to me. Yeah. Hear that? So again, it's subtle, but I can hear it and I don't like it. I want my sound to be clean and it's one of those like pet peeve things that drive me crazy. This is going to be a long video. Excellent. Because I don't have this set to re-trigger, what I'm actually going to do, make another MIDI clip and just use this and just kind of over the course of every single bar, I'll do like eight different versions. So I have some cool like hits right there that sound pretty cool. And I think that will do it. Let me see if there's anything else that I missed. Maybe I want to EQ this because I did right here. But again, it kind of depends on what the sound is. Um, because we already have some, how do I say? Because we already have some spatial effects going on right here, I don't really know if I want to add some reverb to that or not. Oh, I did forget something. All right, let's go ahead and grab a utility. I'll put it right here and I'm just going to go to bass mono for everything that's below 160 hertz. It's going to help keep the sound a little bit more consistent. And this, while utility, I don't know how good or bad it does the job, I know that it does it to some degree, is good because this is one of the biggest reasons why people frequency split. Because if you have detuning on your low end, then you're not going to have a solid sub. And a lot of workarounds that people do is either take out the lows and then add in a clean sub. They'll do a frequency split to keep the sub in mono. But in this case, because of utility, I can go to bass mono and then just keep my low end at a consistent uh, down the middle. So this bass is kind of is just about usable already. I actually have maybe about half of a decibel to play with right there. Some minor peakage. Peakage. <laughs> Some minor peaking right there, but that's okay. Um, 
and we've created a harmonically rich neural base from this that is pretty neat. So I'm going to freeze this and we'll basically go into our resampling component from here. Let me create a new audio track and the shift option to duplicate that. Do select it, shift, option, drag, success. So now we have a really neat wall of sound from here. That we can basically use that to, well, do anything that we want with it. Um, because it's a nice waveform that already has movement in it, we can either cut it further, we can restart the whole process, and basically use that process going back into here and then use detuning and movement, or we can basically chop it up, or we can do like cool glitch things with it, which I will cover briefly. I'll, I'll show you where I would go after this. But you can kind of tell that the general overall theme about what we're doing is basically just trying to shape like a really thick sound, use something to cut it, add some cool like chorus effects or something, we can cut it again, and it doesn't really matter. Like how you would use this is you would listen to this and like, you know, in the context of your song, well, you would basically like make a groove or something. There's no right way to do this, by the way, but how I would do it is I would listen to the groove that I'm making usually with a drum thing and I'd just kind of listen, see if I can create like some kind of like stupid riff out of it or something. So if I like that, I can copy that. And so I can go like and create a call and response. And really from here, it's about trial and error. So I can repeat that like three times because that's creating that expectation. And then on the fourth one, as a call and response, I can just, I can copy this. And again, I'm doing this by the seat of my pants. So uh, you can, if you're just thinking about like a kick snare pattern, so we have like, and we can go in here and repitch that. because we always do half semitones. And I don't want that to lead in. And maybe I'll have in like a, a really short fill right there. And and then right here, I can basically uh, double click on this, hold option and uh, kind of find something that I like or find a different hit and then I can go into here and then go into transposition or I can basically play with some of this stuff and and again like I'm just kind of like doing this as as a means of an example and this is before I go into like further resampling as well but kind of like figuring out a way to use this is or like how a lot of people go into making something out of this you know that's this is a stupid riff I would probably never use this but you understand that you can basically use this as a means of creating a baseline or something with it but yeah what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go in and drop this and pull this into a sampler and from here we're going to cover how to do some other cool stuff. I'm going to right click this. And I'm going to set this to glide. So throwing this into a sampler already is really cool. One thing that you're going to have to be mindful of is that generally this is already on filter and then this is turned down by 12, but it's weird because if you normalize it to zero, it, it's like overwhelmingly loud. And that's fine. I kind of like it that way anyways. But yeah, so on here we can go and make this percussive again, which is kind of like how we did in the first place. I can play with what part I want to do that at. 
Sounds like that Club to Death song. <laughs> you guys are probably too young to, to know what I'm talking about. It's cool because I can start manipulating stuff within Sampler. Oh yeah, that sounds really nice. And I can do that too via through filtering. So we can go back and use our little cool Max for Live trick that I've been using for a long time and set this back to morph. Go here and there we go. Um, that's really fast though. So let's turn that down a little bit and let's see what we got from there. Let's turn that shaper on. Shaper. Shaper. What? Come on. Shaper, please. And turn this up to like 12. Let's give it some resonance. And slow it down. And then um, I'm messing with the transposition here because I'm doing this off of one hand. So I'm holding F on my keyboard and then playing with this. But I mean, you can do like pitch bending and, and whatever, however you like. But I'm just kind of doing this for demonstration purposes. So because our source sound is kind of like square-y, which also has a little bit of like saw properties to it, but we cut a lot of that high end off. That's why you get a lot of those tones. And how your source sound is ultimately like how the general feel of the, the entire bass is going to sound. Uh, one more thing I'd like to mention that is kind of cool that we can do because we're about wrapping up here is we can go and use that same utility trick and go into bass mono here and set it to again like a something anywhere from like 100 to 200 hertz is, will probably do you okay and then what I can do here is I can actually mess with the spread so if I hold this note down and let me actually turn this off for demonstration purposes and go back here this will actually spread the sound out quite a bit, but it's a little bit harder to tell because I have the bass in mono. But if we listen here, that sounds really wide. And then that will help kind of bring everything back in. And your results will vary on this. I was expecting the result of this to be a little bit wider, to be honest, and a little bit more uh, thin out, but I guess that didn't work so well. Uh, we can also play with FM here where we can also use an LFO to modulate some of this stuff. And you kind of have to be careful with this because it's very easy to overdo it. So I have this on chorus as one, and I'll just mess with the volume. Oh. And then you can also set this to have some kind of like envelope if you wanted to. The attack is really high on this 20 seconds, so it'll take a while for that to get there. But if I put some sustain in, then. Oh, that was cool. So, again, like you can get some really neat results just by messing with a lot of the parameters that were that are within this. And then as far as processing goes, you would kind of go back and refer to this chain of how much you want to do it. Now, because we are adding FM to a bass that already has a lot of harmonics, it's really easy to overdo the sound. So I encourage you to be very careful with that. Like at this point, I wouldn't really, unless if I'm going back and filtering, and this is where things get kind of delicate, I even still, I'd be very careful about adding more harmonics to it at this point. Because 
when the sound is coming in, it's already harmonically rich. But when the sound cuts out, there's nothing there. So the only thing that we're going to be drawing from is overdoing the harmonics on our swir sound or creating artifacts because we're trying to pull so much out of it. So we might be able to get away with a little bit of OTT on this. Definitely not at 100%. Like, okay. Um, and then maybe we can try some saturation. I'm going to go into a soft sign. And we'll see if we can get away with doing this a little bit as well. And I don't think that I'd want to do any more than that. From here, I would want to just turn it up. Like, I like that sound a lot. Okay. So then after that, we'd go into our normal limiting process. Maybe I'll introduce some reverb here. And... Let's do this. It's already close, so we're not going to be able to get much out of it. Yeah, some neat tones out of that, though. And we can copy this and then just paste that right here. Command L. Let's try to see if we can introduce some reverb at the end. Now, in the creative choice process, let me show you guys another cool trick. What you can do is you can add reverb before and then add a transient shaper to create some really sick stuff. So let me just demonstrate that really quick. I'm going to take out the lows. Because And what I'm going to do now is uh, Saturn does this best. You can also, you can use a transient shaper by any means, but um, I just like the way that Saturn does this. So all I did was turn the drive down and then add the dynamics up. And the reverb effect that it has is much different. If I turn this down pretty low, maybe not that low. then you will notice it. It's definitely like, if I play this like that, you can't really tell. But if I turn this off, then it's way less noticeable. But if I turn this back up, then it is a little bit more noticeable. So let me set the decay rate down turn this uh, maybe add in more mix it, this is going to take a little bit of like finicking with because I want to accentuate this effect that I'm trying to demonstrate right and then if I do this then you get that uh, that tail at the end which is kind of cool um, but for me, I would probably want to tone that back down. Which sounds really cool. Yeah, I like that a lot. And then what I can do from here is set up a resampling channel and then the process just goes more and more and more and more and more. And from here, we're just basically building ourselves a really cool bass sample pack full of lots of sounds that we can select from. Uh, I would warn you about creating too many. Nine times out of 10, I really don't end up using that much and then I end up like going onto a track and still filtering out stuff or whatever, but it's kind of cool just to see how you can generate tones with that. So that's one way that we can go into um, resampling. Another one that we can do is we can actually, let me turn this off, unfreeze this, 
and we can change a lot of the parameters within this every single time. So because this is set up, we can set a resampling channel. I'm actually going to do it through the means of this one. And, and what we can do is change a parameter and then resample it again. So here's what I mean. I'll start with, I want to do something that's easy to go back to. So I'll start with just this one, right? We'll record that out. Let me set this to no count in. And I have that source sound there. Then on this one, I can go in and I can actually change this to something different. Um, let me find something else that has harmonics in it. Spectral Monster 9. I don't know. I'm just... I can search for a tone. And then I can record that one out. Let's do it like this. So I'll set this to A and B. And then... I'll set this to one half. And I want this to be like a 24 or something. So it's really tight. And record that out. Um, it's not really that effective. So maybe we can go into a multi, go into a, a BN, which is a bandpass notch. If I can find it, there it is. Let's set the frequency here. I'm going to add this there, but do the polar opposite. Set the drive up and record that out. And then change this, change this, go in here go to a different one. Maybe I'll add in some movement here. Um, maybe set this one to a double notch. That one sounds pretty good. And then record that out. So you can kind of see how this process goes. There's multiple ways to resample, but it depends on like what your personal workflow is. And I highly encourage you to experiment with all of them. But yeah, I didn't want to cover how to make a specific kind of neurobase. I just wanted to show you the components and the creative processes that you can go through for creating in-depth bases and I guess some brief introductions of how to apply them through using this formula. The Glitch Kitchen did a really fantastic job with that picture here. I will leave a link in the description of where you can find that. Where? Here it is. Uh, of where you can find it or you can take a screenshot of this themselves but this is a really great mantra or point of reference or guideline and I, I notice that I say guideline because it's not there's multiple ways to do this this is just a way that I like to explore and create some deep heavy movement of creating some cool stuff and um, I hope that this was informative to you guys I know that this video is going to be incredibly long but there is so much to talk about within this and I encourage you guys to kind of like once you have the formula you can do a plus b plus c or you can do a plus c plus b or you can do a plus d plus e plus c as long as you know the kind of variables and how to kind of fit all of these things in it's really easy to um, create interesting cool stuff of how to do all that the last thing that I did not do is I didn't add an EQ at the very end because right now I'm just in the sound design process so I'm not really worried about fitting this into the context of track because I don't even know how that track sounds right now but I want it to be loud and I want it to be usable to where I don't have to do too much to it so that's why I try to keep everything at a consistent level that way if I really wanted to I can throw it in and turn it down as opposed to try to introduce more harmonics at the risk of turning it up or sorry turn it up at the risk of introducing more harmonics I had it backwards but yeah that's it for today's video I know that this was a lengthy one Hopefully this stuff was interesting to you guys and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you guys for watching and subscribe to the damn channel.